welcome to Griffin Center Point. If you would stand with us this morning. This week we have faced tragedy in our city. We had one student here at Griffin High School, Laniza Mazel, that went to be with Jesus just a little bit too early. And we had a student here in Pike County, Dylan Thomas, that went to meet Jesus just a little bit too early. And this week's been difficult for our community. But I came this morning to tell you there is hope and there is strength in Jesus. John, the 16th chapter, Jesus tells us, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. I don't know about you this morning, but I'm so thankful that I had the Holy Spirit living inside of me that can guide me and comfort me during these tough times in life. Amen. Amen. Holy Spirit, we welcome you into this house this morning. Come and have your way this morning. Come and spend a little bit of time with us this morning. Encourage us, strengthen us, build us up this morning, Father, because we need a touch from heaven today, God. God, we ask you come in this place. Have your way this morning, God. Do whatever you see fit, God. God, I pray for each person that's here this morning, God. Open their hearts, God. Open their ears, God. Soften them this morning, God, so that they can hear the word that you have for us this morning. God, we worship you. We magnify you, God. We lift your name up above all circumstances this morning, God. God, and we'll be careful in life to give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. And it's in Jesus' holy name we pray. And everybody says amen. Jesus, for who you are today, sing, oh, oh, oh yes, you're worthy, oh, oh, yes, you're holy, oh, 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 sing inside, he's coming on the clouds, he's coming on the clouds, kings and kingdoms will bow down, oh, oh, and every chain will break. His broken hearts declare His praise For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Sing this out, our God Our God is a lion, the lion of Judah He's roaring with power and fighting our battles And every knee will bow before Him Cause our God is a lamb, the lamb that was slain for the sins of the world, His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. And every knee will bow before Him. Oh, 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 Come on, put your hands together this morning. Sing, so open up the gates. So open up the gates. Make way before the King of Kings. And here to set the captives free For who can stop the Lord sins of the world His blood breaks the chains and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb and every knee will bow before Him Every knee will bow and every tongue confess to Your name, Jesus The whole world's gotta know about You, Lord fighting for us today and no one can stop you. but who can stop the Lord Almighty who can stop the Lord Almighty who can stop the Lord Almighty who can stop the Lord oh, 
come on choir, let's just declare that out. Who can stop the Lord no Almighty? No one can stop you, God. Who can stop the Lord God, Almighty? God, I believe that today. Who can stop the Lord no one Almighty? No stands in the way today. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Come on, let's declare that out. Who can stop the Lord? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? God, you're worthy to do this place, Lord. Oh. Who can stop the Lord God, you're Almighty? church said amen. amen. You may be seated. God bless you for being here today. We're so honored to have you worship with us today on this beautiful Lord's Day, the first Sunday of October. We're so delighted to see you in the house of the Lord. You should have received a handout today when you walked in. We have some wonderful greeters that always make sure you receive a handout, kind of just let you keep informed as to what we're doing here at the church. You'll see the very front page is this, generational discipleship. And this is what we have adopted for the fall of this year. For the fall of this year, we've adopted this. Here's what we want to do as a church promoting this, a lifestyle of following Jesus, continuing, connecting, and conforming. Those are the three words that I preached to you last Sunday when I preached to you about discipleship. What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? Not just a fan of Jesus Christ, but a follower of Jesus Christ. And I preached to you about continuing. Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples. I talked to you about Connecting, how important it is that every believer be connected. Be connected to a local church. Be connected to brothers and sisters in the Lord. Then I talk to you about conforming. This whole thing about discipleship is simply this, is that we be like Jesus. That we are conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. So this is what you're going to be hearing about a lot the next three months is simply this, generational discipleship. It's all about continuing, connecting, and conforming. And how many of you would agree with me today? It's all about being more like Jesus. Amen. That's what it's all about. And I'm excited about what God's going to do for us in the fall of this year. Well, I'm going to ask Davis to come at this time, our youth pastor. He's got something he wants to share with you about this evening. Tonight we have fusion worship happening. It's going to be upstairs in the loft. If you've never been before, you need to come check it out. It's going to be awesome. Um, we aim it for middle school, high school, and college age, but everyone's welcome. We would love to see you. We're going to be lifting Jesus up. Um, I believe I have a word tonight that is for this generation and for these students and um, I don't know if you know it or not, but a lot of the issues that students face, as adults, we face the same issues. Sometimes we're a little bit better with dealing with them and working through them. But a lot of times in life, we all face the same issues of whether we're good enough, whether we measure up, whether we're walking in the plan that God has for us. That's some issues that we all face. 
So I believe tonight God has given me some insight and some words to share, and I would love to see you here tonight. If you know somebody that's, that's in high school, that's in middle school, that's in college, if it's you, get them here. Get them here. Be here tonight, 6 p.m., upstairs in the loft. It's going to be awesome. Just expecting God to do big things. Amen. All right. Thank you, Davis. Also, uh, Terry Skinner's coming with uh, something very, very special that our outreach ministry is doing. He's going to share it with you. Thank you, Pastor. Whoa. <laughs> Hot mic. <clears throat> you know, in being more like Christ, uh, we want to mirror and image his reflection in giving. And uh, this church has two opportunities. Uh, the first we spoke about last Sunday, and this is just reiterating, the uh, coats and blankets is all month long. So if you have coats and blankets that you uh, want to donate, you know, the team here will be distributing these coats and blankets to people that need them. You know, right now, uh, it's looking like we're not even going to have a winter, but if it does get cold, one day in the cold without warmth is suffering. So I, I just, you know, ask that you just do the best you can and, and find some coats that you don't need and blankets. And if you don't have any, do like uh, my wife and I did. We just went out and bought some blankets. So you can leave them uh, in the... Uh, I'm, I'm terrible with the names around here. Out the door there. <laughs> what, what's, what's the name of that? Lobby. Lobby. Yeah. Right yeah, right. Well, not there. The, the, the next one. <laughs> yeah. Foyer. You can leave the coats and the blankets at the foyer. The second thing is, everything's got a name around here. Right? <laughs> the second thing is we're having a chicken queue. And what this is, because I've had several people ask, you know, we, we, we always do Christmas in a shoebox. Why do we need to fundraise for it? We're not fundraising for Christmas in a shoebox. We're, we're fundraising to just go a little over and beyond. Uh, this, w this church has, has, has an awesome uh, connection with, this, with th these students at Atkinson Elementary, and we just want to go over and beyond every year and just grow on it. So we're selling chicken plates, $8. The way I hear it, $8 is cheap for all that uh, comes with it. So uh, that'll be, chicken queue is October the 20th, but we're selling tickets until then. So if you want to buy a ticket for 8 bucks, we'll be outside the church after church. Thank you. All right. Terry, that's the commons. The commons. It's okay. It's the commons. I had to learn it too. It's okay. I want to uh, share with you something very, very special that's going to be happening here two weeks from today. And that is Pastor Freddy Edwards and his wife Suzette are going to be here to minister in our service. The reason I invited them here is because of what God has done for them. Truly a miracle. And we're calling it Miracle Sunday. And I felt in my spirit prompted to have them come and challenge us to believe God for miracles that we need in our life. How many of you know there's nothing too big for our God? Amen. Nothing. Suzette Edwards, a pastor's wife, dealt with Parkinson's disease for 14 years. For 14 years, she battled. One of the most courageous women I've ever seen in my life battled through it all. She had got to the place where she could not climb stairs. She had got to the place she couldn't walk. She was on medication for 14 years. There was no hope for her. She was progressively getting worse and worse. She had gotten very weak. She couldn't hardly go. She couldn't do the normal things that what we would take for, a, for granted sometimes. But this year, on Good Friday of March 28th, on Good Friday morning, when she woke up that morning because she had been seeking the Lord and seeking the Lord for healing, that when she woke up on Good Friday, she turned to her husband and said to Freddie, I feel normal. I feel normal. She got out of bed and could walk by herself she walked around the room. They have a two-story home. She started going up and down the stairs. She ran outside and started running around the yard. Understand, it had been years since she had been able to do anything like that. 
Just recently at a doctor's appointment, the doctors are amazed and said, we've never seen this. We've never seen Parkinson's get to this stage and then have a complete turnaround. It is truly a miracle from God and they are rejoicing over that miracle. I want to say to you that two weeks from today, I'm calling it Miracle Sunday. Pastor Fred and his wife will both be here. She's going to share her testimony. She's a dancer. She loves to dance, but hadn't been able to dance in a long time. I'm talking about dancing before the Lord. And I've asked her to dance that day, and she'll do an amazing job. A woman that was battling Parkinson's can get up and dance before the Lord with all her might. I'm talking about Pastor Freddie Edwards is going to be preaching to us about miracles. You don't want to miss two weeks from today. Be sure and tell everybody you can. Let everybody know that we are going to take a huge step and we're going to declare nothing is impossible with our God. And we're going to see great and mighty things done for his glory. Can I get an Amen. And then three weeks from today is Celebration Sunday. We do this twice a year. This is the Sunday where we offer church membership. And I've already had several tell me I'm ready to join the church. We have classes on Wednesday night that you need to attend. We also have water baptism that day. And we have child uh, uh, dedication that day. So if you have children that you want to dedicate to the Lord that day or you want to get baptized that day, let us know. We're going to sign you up. Call the church office. Let us know you want to participate and we're going to celebrate that day and it's going to be another great day in the Lord. I want to say today thank you to Sister Marjorie Crowley. Crowley. She has been a part of our church for 20 years. Marjorie, would you come up here with me, please? I'm going to honor her today and thank her. She worked in our church school for many years, and she has worked in our church office also. For 20 years, she has worked in our school and our church office. And today, I want to thank her publicly, present her a plaque that simply says, presented to Marjorie Crowley, in appreciation and gratefulness for 20 years of dedication and service to our church, Center Point Church. And I want to thank her for everything she's done. She's been a tremendous blessing. Marjorie, thank you from the bottom of our heart. And your church family loves you. And we appreciate you. And we honor you today. Would you let Marjorie know that we love and appreciate her today? Come on, let her know that we love and appreciate her today and we thank God for her. God bless you. you may be seated. Josiah, I'd like for you and Darlena to come at this time. And uh, is Titus here? Darlena? Oh, is, he, is Titus here? I'd like for him to come also. I want Darlene to come, and I want to introduce to you today the newest member of our church. We got a new one, and she is beautiful, and her name is Joanna. They're going to bring Joanna up here. Come on, Darlene. Look at here. Now, how old is Titus? Titus is three years old? Two and a half years old. About a month before Joanna was born, one Sunday here at the church, I asked Titus, I said, Titus, are you excited about getting a baby sister? And he said, no. <laughs> but I think he's excited now. Okay, you know the routine. At this point, normally I would take her and normally I would introduce her to every section. That's what we would normally do. But today we can't do it. So I'm asking Penny to, hey, Titus, give it up for Titus. Now, turn around. Hey, Titus, are you happy to have a baby sister? Titus. Titus. Are you glad to have a baby sister? Okay, I think he's going to be a choir member one day. He's fascinated by that choir. Penny, I want you to come. 
I want you to take Joanna, just walk her across the front, let everybody meet Miss Joanna. She is so beautiful. Oh, look at her. Look at that. Beautiful eyes. How are you doing? You've had a good recovery? Good. Isn't this a beautiful family? Isn't this a beautiful family? All right, here's Miss Joanna. She's fascinated by those lights. She's looking at those. How old is she now? Uh, seven weeks. Seven weeks old. Isn't she beautiful? I want everybody to welcome our new member. Thank you, Penny. And what we're going to do, I want you guys to stand there a minute. We're going to get your picture, okay? All right. <laughs> we got it? All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. God bless you. Give it to them one more time. Is, is Alex and Macy here? They're upstairs. They upstairs? They're not here. To, okay. Well, we want to congratulate Alex and Macy. Um, they're getting married this Saturday, Alex Purvis and uh, Macy Chadwick. They're getting married, and they are a young couple who are a tremendous blessing to our church. You rarely see them because every Sunday they work in our children's ministry and they are a tremendous help to our children's ministry. And we congratulate them today. We congratulate them today on their marriage and we pray God's blessings on their marriage. Also today, I want to say congratulations to Jenny Wilson. Jenny, I read about you this week and Jenny teaches at the Jordan Hill Elementary School here in Griffin, and this week she was awarded the Griffin Spalding County Teacher of the Year for Jordan Hill Elementary. Stand up, Jenny, stand up. Come on, give it up for Jenny, all right. That is awesome. Uh, Mary Foster, would you come? Mary is a, such a blessing to our church. She heads up our nursing home ministry. And now, every month, we are at three different nursing homes here in the city of Griffin. She heads it up. She has a great team of people that work with her. She had pursued ministry. She has a passion for ministry. She loves people. She went and received her exhorter certificate with our church, the Church of God. And then just recently, she advanced in ministry and she became a licensed minister in the Church of God. And we are very, very proud of her. And today I present to her this certificate from her church and I want her to know that we're proud of her and we love her and we thank God for her. Would you give her another God bless you? Thank you, Mary. Stand there, we'll get your picture. Now, give, let me get a picture with you. Okay. <laughs> I don't want to let you go. <laughs> All right, thank you. Give it up for Mary one more time. <laughs> Crystal Roberts, would you come? I, I want to take just a moment. When I read what you posted on Facebook this week, my heart was overwhelmed. I want you to take a minute and I want you to share with everybody what God has done for you recently. I had surgery back on July 3rd um, of this year, a couple months ago. And since then, I started going through... Um, it was more like anxiety at first. I would get short with my boys when normally I wouldn't. And then one weekend, I just exploded. It was, it was rough at the Roberts house, I tell you that. Um, 
So my mom and my best friend told me, they're like, Crystal, something is up. You've got to go to the doctor. I dealt with postpartum depression after Clint was born that was really, really bad. And they both said, this is how you're acting. This is what's going on. So I went to the doctor, and they changed medication. Hormones were fine. But I'd been out of church. Um, if some of you may or may not have noticed, I had stepped out of choir. I told my family indefinitely for now I was stepping out of choir till I could get myself together. And three weeks ago, I came, and I didn't sing in the choir. I came out here, and I sat, and pastor preached on our attorney. And God met me here. And that week and the next week, um, the authority of the believer was the message. And once again, God spoke to me that day. If it was for nobody else in this sanctuary, that mess, those messages were for me alone. So... Um, after that, it was music. God posted, you know, through people, music and testimonies and stuff that I was constantly seeing on social media until I finally felt, I think it was last Wednesday, to make my story public. And when I did, it was like a weight lifted. So I'm t completely on the turnaround now, feeling more like myself than I was. So it was bad. Yeah, but, but God, but God. But God. Yeah. Let me say something. The Bible teaches us we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. And when you gave a word of testimony, it has blessed so many people. And I'm so thankful for what the Lord has done in you. I can see it. I see it in you. And thank God, if God can do it for her, God can do it for you. God can do it for anybody. And today we celebrate this. Come on, celebrate with Crystal. Let her know how happy we are. Love you. I would like at this time for Jeremy and Cassandra and Brantley and Ellie and Millie to come, if they will. This is the Tony family, a beautiful family. Aren't they beautiful? This is Jeremy, Cassandra, Millie, Ellie, Brantley. This family has been a part of our church for six years. When about, isn't that about right? About six years? You tell me, four, okay. And when they came here, they got involved. They didn't just sit back. They got involved. And they have been tremendous workers here in our church. And they got involved in our children's ministries. And they dedicated themselves to our children's ministry. They have such a passion for children. One reason is God's blessed them with three beautiful children. They have a passion. When Brother Chandler Sims went to North Rome Church in Rome, Georgia, I took some time and I prayed and I sought the Lord. I pursued a lot of different avenues of asking the Lord about our next children's pastor. And every time I prayed, and every time I went elsewhere, in my spirit, I kept coming back to the Tonys. They did not ask for this position. They did not come to me. I went to them because that's what I was feeling in my spirit. And I asked them to pray. They, at first, heard me out, listened to me because I saw something in them. I saw something in them just like I saw something in Chandler. I saw leadership in them. I knew in my spirit they had qualities of leadership that would be a blessing to our children's ministries. So we put them on as interim. We asked them to serve as interim. They served as interim uh, at now for almost uh, six weeks, almost two months. And then I went to them and I said, I feel like after pursuing and praying, asking the Lord to direct me, that you guys are the ones who need to lead our children's ministries. And they accepted it. They are a tremendous family and a tremendous blessing to our church. And today, I introduce to you our new children's pastors, Jeremy and Cassandra Tony. Now, 
I would like for all of our children and our children's ministries workers to come forward, if you will. If you will, let's bring Princess. Yeah, just bring them on up. Isn't this a beautiful sight? Isn't this a beautiful sight? Now here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask right where you are. We're going to pray a prayer dedication over Jeremy and Cassandra and their babies and the entire staff and all of our children. We want God to bless our children's ministries. We want God to prosper our children's ministries. And I promise you this, when your children come to children's ministries, either Sunday morning or Wednesday night, they are getting the word. They're getting the word of God. That's what we need to do is put the word in them while they're young. Because when you train them up, when they're old, they will not depart from the faith. So I'm going to ask you right where you are to stretch forth your hand and we're going to pray over the Tonys and we're going to pray over our children's ministries. Father, I thank you for Jeremy and Cassandra. I thank you, Lord, for every worker, every adult that works with them in our children's ministries, whether it be Sunday morning or whether it be Wednesday night. We pray your blessings upon them. We pray, Lord, your anointing upon them. We pray that our children will learn your word at a very young age and it will stay in their heart the rest of their lives. So, Father, we pray for creativity with the Tonys as they lead and direct our children's ministry. And we believe your blessings are going to be upon it now in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Would you give our children's ministries a God bless you? Come on, give it up for them. Man, that's a good looking group of kids right there. We want you to know we welcome you today. If this is your first time here, you'll not go anywhere to where you'll be more welcome than you are right here at Griffin Center Point Church. We welcome you. Do we have any first timers today? Anybody? Do we have any first timers today? Okay. Second timers. Third timers. Let me tell you this. When you've come three times, you're no longer a guest. You're one of us. So I want you to do something with me, church family. I want everybody to stand. Everybody stand with me, if you will. And here's what I want us to do. We're going to have fellowship here in a moment. But I'm going to tell you this. I want us to outdo Chick-fil-A. When you go to Chick-fil-A, you get welcomed. That's one of the reasons they prosper like they do. Man, you feel right at home. I went to one recently. Man, I'm telling you what, they created a great atmosphere for me to eat in simply because they welcomed me. I want us to outdo Chick-fil-A. Go to at least seven people, shake their hand, tell them how good they look and how glad you are to see them in the house of the Lord today. Welcome, committee. Go to work.
Lord bless you. You may be seated. I want to thank you for your stewardship, the way you're continually faithful in your tithe and offerings. It's such a blessing to hear it at our church. And we're able to do what we do because of you. Every ministry is supported by you. And I want to thank you. I want our ushers to come at this time. And I'm going to ask everybody to bow your head and repeat after me. We're going to pray together today. Would you repeat after me? Dear Lord, thank you for your goodness to me. You are my source of everything. And today, I honor you with my first fruits. I bring my tithes and offerings into your storehouse and I bless you in Jesus name amen God bless you church as we worship together in tithe and offerings Come on. I will rest. 
building let's just worship him this moment lift your hands as a sign of surrender dear jesus come into this place right now meet us here bring heaven to earth jesus hallowed be your name your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven jesus we surrender to you today because of your goodness because of your grace come on right now just talk to him say thank you jesus Thank you, Jesus. God, I couldn't repay anything you've done, but you're worthy. Thank you, God. Both now and 
forever forever Jesus we sing God you're so good yes you are Jesus and God you're so good oh, Jesus forever you're good Lord If God has been good to you, would you stand up on your feet and give him praise? Would you give him praise? Because I am blessed, I am called, I am healed, I am whole, I am saved in Jesus' name. Highly favored, anointed, filled with your power for the glory.
Let's praise Him for His goodness today. Come on, let's give Him praise for His goodness today. Come on, let's praise Him for His goodness. Come on, somebody give the Lord a clap offering and give Him a shout of praise because He's been good to you. He's been good to you. Lord, we praise you for your goodness. We praise you for your goodness. And the church said, Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. I want to say thank you today to Nathan. Didn't he do an awesome job today? Jonathan is at World Changers Church today. And uh, Nathan always steps up when, when Jonathan needs to be gone. Nathan always steps up and does an amazing job. Thank you to our choir and all of our musicians and all of our singers who always do a great, great job. Well, today, I'm going to try to do better. I wore this last Sunday for the first time, and I didn't do good. The purpose of this is to keep my arm still. I'm not supposed to move this arm or this shoulder. The good news is I'm doing better. I'm learning. It's a hard lesson to learn for somebody who's very active. The doctor told me this week, when I got my stitches out, the doctor told me this week, I have to wear this four more weeks, and I'm not, listen to this, I am not supposed to pick up anything heavier than a fork with this arm. So I'm learning. I'm learning to live with one hand. I sure do miss my left hand. The doctor told me that this was going to be my friend because it's going to keep all of this steel where nothing can move. But I'm not convinced it's my friend yet because now it's with me 24-7. So I'm learning. Somebody say, help him, Jesus. Learning that this is my friend, so I'm doing better. So I'm going to try to do better today. Um, and, and I've asked the Lord to help us today to receive something from the word of the Lord. Anybody, glad, anybody just glad to be in church today? Anybody just, come on, anybody just glad to be in church today? Well, I'm glad you're here. Now, this morning, I want to share with you from the Old Testament, and we're going to look at a unique verse of Scripture from 1 Kings chapter 22, verse 48. And I want to share with you from 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 48, and the name of this message is Ships That Never Sail. Ships that never sail. Let's go to this scripture and then we'll be going to another scripture and we'll have it on the screen for you. I want to go once again back to 1 Kings chapter 22, verse 48, and it talks about Jehoshaphat, King Jehoshaphat. Now, Jehoshaphat built a fleet of trading ships to go to Ophir. Ophir is on the east coast of Africa. That's where that is. So King Jehoshaphat built a fleet of trading ships that were to go to Orpha, Africa for gold. But they never set sail because they were wrecked at Izan Gilbert. Gilbert. I want to see from this scripture for a few moments this morning something that I think is really a fascinating scripture, something that should really get our attention. Jehoshaphat was the fourth king of Judah. Judah was a tribe of Israel, one of the 12 tribes of Israel. He was the fourth king of Israel, and he became king when he was 35 years of age, and he served as king of Judah for 25 years. He was blessed of God, he was rich, and he was very, very powerful. He built four churches throughout Judah. He ruled in honorable ways as his father Asa did. He stood against evil. He walked according to the ways of the Lord, and he built an incredible military. He built a military in Judah that other tribes and nations had to respect. 
because of such a powerful, powerful military force. He was truly a great, great king. A king that honored God. A king that always tried to do good. But I want you to see what happens to Jehoshaphat. In his 25-year reign, you see that there came a time when Judah went through an economic downturn. Things got bad. Economically, Judah had been strong, but they went through a time when things turned and really got bad. And Jehoshaphat start, decided to build ships and to start trade with other tribes and nations. Now, that's nothing new because we see it in our nation. We see it in our world. As a matter of fact, it's very healthy to do business with other nations. When we can sell them things that they need that we make or they can sell us things that they build that we need, it's called trade. And trade can be a tremendous blessing to a nation. It can help prosper the nation. So now he decides to make Zion Gilber a trade, a, a port city. It was right there on the sea of, of, of the Red Sea, and he decided what we're going to do, we're going to make it the trade center for our tribe. And from there, he begins to build a fleet of ships. Ships back in ancient days of commerce and trade were very common. They were the bone of the ancient commerce and trade business and travel. They could bring life to a depressed nation. The plan was to send these ships to Ophir, buy gold and bring them back. That was the purpose to begin trade. However, you read these words about the ships but they never set sail. A fleet of ships that never left the port of Ezon Gilber never set sail for they were wrecked at the port. You see, when you, when you think about that, it, it was very common for ships to be wrecked at sea. That's nothing unusual. For if a storm were to come, if some kind of storm were to come and the ship were to toss over and sink and people drowned. Matter of fact, you can read your Bible about storms and how certain ships went down even in those days. But not only with the storms, but back in those days, pirates were very common. It was very common in that day for you had to be you had to be really really careful because if you had valuable cargo on your ship pirates would come invade your ship kill everyone on board take the valuable products such as gold and sink the ship set it on fire and let it sink so we know that if ships were at sea that it's common for storms to come up in seas with wind currents and the way the wind blows. And for it to be common for pirates to be there who would take and steal and destroy. But what's amazing about this verse is this fleet of ships were not destroyed at sea. There was no hurricane that, that, that out while they were out at sea. There were no pirates. There was no storms. What really gets your attention is to know that this fleet of ships was destroyed while they were at port. They never set sail. So that tells me that these ships never fulfilled their purpose. Because there was a purpose for these ships. The purpose was not for them to sit in port. You don't build a great ship for it to just sit in port. You build a great ship for it to sail the seas. So now they never, never, never 
fulfilled their purpose. These ships were not just to sell the seed. They were also to make trade. They were vessels that people traveled with and did trade with. We can take trade from here to there and take trade from there to here. And now they're not doing that because as long as they're sitting in port, there's no trade going on, which means they were built to sell and they were built to make trade and now they're sitting at poor. They never fulfilled their purpose. What's happened in life is when people talk about dreams and I love dreamers. I'm a dreamer. I love to dream about big things. I love to dream about doing great things for the kingdom of God. I'm a dreamer, been dreaming for years, just like Joseph was a dreamer. People who have dreamed great big dreams for the kingdom of God, but unfortunately, they've never left port. They've never fulfilled their purpose. I love it when you plan I think one of the things about leadership and, and when you're in leadership is always planning ahead, not looking back because our victory is always in front of us, not behind us. To go ahead, that's what I believe is great about men and women who are dreamers. They're always planning ahead. And not only that, but I love to hear people talk about dreams. This is my dream. But it's so sad when dreamers never fulfilled their purpose. It's so sad when churches never fulfill their purpose. Some churches are like a ship that's in dock. They never get out in the sea. There's no trade ever going on. And they never fulfill their purpose. Because everything and everybody was created for purpose. You were created with purpose. God designed you for purpose. God designed churches for purpose. He designed the kingdom for purpose. And one of the saddest things that could ever take place in life is for people, believers, Christians, churches, kingdom people to never fulfill their purpose because God has set purpose in us. Why did the ships not sail? You know, when I read this scripture, the first thing I want to know is why did these ships never get out of port? Why did these ships never wave, never go and hit a wave? Why did these ships simply sit when they were built to sail? I found out the reason. As a matter of fact, I found out the reason in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 35, 36, and 37. In this scripture, it write, the writer writes about it also. Listen, if you will, to 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 30 through verse 37. Later... Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, made an alliance with Ahazah, king of Israel, whose ways were wicked. He agreed to construct a fleet of trading ships after these were built at Ezer Jeber. Eliezer, who was a prophet prophesied against Jehoshaphat saying because you made an alliance with Ahazi the Lord will destroy what you have made and the ships were wrecked and they were not able to set sail to trade. When you go to this scripture it tells you why those ships never Set sail. Here's why. You're taking notes, write this down. 
that a godly king, a good king, found himself making an alliance with a wicked king. An alliance is a contract. It's an agreement. We see it with nations and countries, and we see it with businesses, and we see it with people. Behind this alliance was money, power, and control. I thought of three questions that Jehoshaphat should have asked himself. Here's what he should have asked himself. Does this honor God? This alliance that I'm about to make with a wicked king, does this honor God? Did you know it's a great, great way to base your decisions in life on? And what I'm going to do in what I'm going to be a part of, will it honor God? Ask yourself, is this honoring God? It's a great question to consider. It's a great question to ask yourself. But he never asked that question. There's another question Jehoshaphat could have asked himself, and that is this. Does this operate within the principles of the Word of God? Does this operate within those principles of the Word of God? That's the great thing about the Word of God. It gives us principles to live by. Jesus taught principles all the time. That's what his teachings were all about. Jesus' teachings were not just rules and regulations. They were principles by which if you live your life by, you can have success. The second question to ask yourself is, does this decision line up with the Word of God? Because if it doesn't, I really don't want to do it. I want what I do to line up with God's Word. That's what happens in Psalms 1 when David writes about the blessed man. Blessed is he who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight shall be in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the river of water, bringing forth fruit in due season. In other words... I want my decisions to line up with God so that my decisions can bear fruit for the kingdom of God. There is a third question I find that Jehoshaphat should have asked himself, and that is this. If I make this alliance with a wicked, evil king, will I compromise? Will I compromise you see, compromise is something that you don't hear a lot of in the church anymore. We used to hear things about don't compromise your belief. Don't compromise your faith. Don't compromise your trust in God. Don't compromise. Compromise is when you start backing up. But you got to understand, there's no place for compromise for the people of God. You just missed a great place to say Amen. There's no place to compromise for the people of God. We're not going to compromise what we believe in. We're not going to compromise the name of Jesus. We're not going to compromise the word of God. We're not going to compromise our faith in God. I know the world looks at us and thinks we're crazy. I know the world looks at us and wonders all about us and say, oh, that's those religious fanatics. No, we're not just religious fanatics. We are people who take God at his word, and we believe when we honor God in his word, he can bless his people. He's done it over and over and over again. Don't compromise your belief. Don't compromise well, pastor, I, you know, I just gave in. I just gave in. No, we're not people who give in. We're people who stand on the word. So when you ask yourself these three questions, 
Why didn't he say, does this honor God? Does this operate within the principles of the word of God? Well, it caused me to compromise. Those are three good decisions. Listen, church, when you're making a decision, these are three good questions to ask yourself. Look what happens. Here we go. Y'all ready? Do this. Come on, smile and do this. Number one, Jehoshaphat was made in an alliance with the king of Israel and it was an alliance of disobedience. Look at 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And we know all about disobedience because I talked to you about it just the other day from Romans and, and, and we read Romans chapter five, verse nine, for as though disobedience came by one, the man, were, many were made sinners. Also through the obedience of one man, many were made righteous. So here's what we find out in Romans chapter five, verse 19. It was the disobedience of Adam that brought sin in the world. It was the obedience of Jesus that brought salvation into the world. But look at this. Jehoshaphat, he followed the ways of his father Asa and did not stray from them. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Hmm. However, we're missing a little bit there, so I'm going to read it to you. However, here it is. However, he made it and he compromised and he made an alliance with a very, very wicked king. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 32, it says, He was a good man, good king, following the ways of his father. He did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight during his reign. But catch this, everybody catch this. However... He failed to remove all the pagan shrines and the people never fully committed themselves to following the God of their ancestors. Now we got it good. And the people never fully committed themselves to following the ways of the Lord. In other words, he got to the place where his obedience was partial obedience. Not full obedience. Because he never did away with the false gods that were in Judah. He never did away with the false idols that were in Judah. He never did away with all of those. And now because he did that, his affecting the people through his disobedience, and now he starts operating in partial obedience. Here's the problem with that. This is the problem. Partial obedience is really disobedience. Somebody needs to write that down. Partial obedience is really disobedience. Because partial obedience means I will pick and choose what I choose I will take parts of the word of God that I like. I will, as long as I'm preaching this or that, but, but if pastor's preaching on miracles and prosperity and anointing, I'll take that. But if he preaches on righteousness and holiness and how to treat people right, I don't want none of that. And we're living in a day of partial obedience where we come to the house of the Lord and we pick and choose what we desire. But the bottom line is we need to be in obedience in every way unto the Lord. We need to walk in a holy way, a righteous way. We need to walk before the Lord in a way that is pleasing to him. And it was partial obedience because when you're connected to disobedience, it doesn't take you up, it takes you down. Jonah is an awesome illustration of this. We all know about Jonah where God spoke to him and told him to go to Nineveh. He did not want to go to Nineveh. He did not want to go to Nineveh. He did not like those people. Somehow, we got in our mind a long time ago 
that we're going to like everything the Lord tells us to do. I don't mind telling you, there's been some times the Lord told me to do some things I wasn't excited about. There's been times the Lord told me to do some things I didn't get excited or happy about. There's been times the Lord has told me, apologize to that person, and I didn't think I had to apologize. But I couldn't get a release until I picked up the phone and called them and apologized. There's been times the Lord told me to do things for people I didn't want to do. I remember many years ago, I was an evangelist. I was traveling. I drove a Cadillac. I know what it's like for the Lord to speak to you to give your car away. I loved my car. You would have loved it. It was white. It had red leather interior. It had those fancy wheels. It was a beautiful car. And the Lord spoke to me one day and told me to give it to somebody. And I said, get behind me, Satan. (laughs) Give my car away. And he told me who to give it to. And I called that person. I said, I need to come see you. I need to come see you. And gave him the keys and the title and the deed. See, sometimes we think God, when he speaks to us, we're just going to be, I'm telling you, sometimes God will tell you to do some things you don't like doing. Sometimes God will tell you to love somebody that's hard to love. Sometimes God will tell you to do things you really don't want to do. But here's what I've learned. When you cooperate with God and you walk in obedience, it's amazing the blessings God can pour out in your life. It's amazing what God can do. Therefore, I challenge you, don't walk in partial obedience because partial obedience is really disobedience. Serve God in every way. Brother, be faithful to your wife. Sister, be faithful to your husband. Make up your mind. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord and we're not going to be partial saints. We're going to be full saints of God and we're going to give God everything. Come on, church. Give the Lord a clap offering and shout amen. Be honest in your dealings. Be honest on your taxes. Be honest in your relationships. Be honest with people. Don't be partial Christians. Be sold out Christians. The second thing I want you to see in this scripture is not only do you see where the King Jehoshaphat operated in disobedience, secondly, he operated in disapproval. When he made an alliance with a wicked king and it was all about money, he received the disapproval of God. Listen, if you will, to 2 Corinthians 6.14. And I know in 2 Corinthians, Paul deals with marriage and you find the words, don't be unequally yoked and marriage is an alliance. That's what it is. It's an agreement. It's a covenant. But listen to what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers for what fellowship does goodness have with wickedness How can light live with darkness? And to think that God was just going to automatically approve of Jehoshaphat's deal. Listen to what happens. And the priest, Eleazar, prophesied. This is in 2 Chronicles 20, 37. Eleazar prophesied against Jehoshaphat. Here you have a priest, a man of God, coming against the king. He doesn't speak on his behalf. He speaks against the king, and he says this. These are strong words. Are you ready for a strong word? Can you handle it? Here it is. The prophet Eleazar said, because you have made an alliance with this wicked king, the Lord will destroy what you have made. Now, isn't that sh- that, that's shouting right there, man. You preach like that, you won't have many friends. 
You start preaching like that, folks will leave you alone. Because as I said last Sunday, we're into the good, the feel-good preaching. Everything's got to make us feel good. Everything's got to make us happy. Everything's got to be like we want it. Everything. And now here's a prophet of God that stands against the king and says, everything, every ship you have built, God's going to destroy it. Why? Because you've made an alliance with wickedness and evil. You left God out. You left God out. Can I say something this morning? Very plain. God hates sin. God never blesses sin. You will not find one place in the Bible where God ever blessed sin. He blesses obedience. But he never approves of sin. He never approves it. And now what we have is this whole fleet that has been built Eliezer says, God's going to destroy it. These ships are never going to leave dock. These ships will never sail. These ships are never going to carry that gold you talked about. These ships are never going to Africa. These ships aren't going anywhere because it wasn't approved of God. How many times do we just do things and automatically think God's going to approve it? How many times we just do things? We don't even pray about it. We just do things. Well, God will bless that. God will bless that. How many times we just do things and we never even involve God in it? You know the greatest prayer we can ever pray is the prayer Jesus prayed in the garden. Father, not my will, but your will be done. The greatest prayer you can ever pray is God, order my steps, direct my paths. I will not lean upon my own understanding, but in all of my ways, I will acknowledge you because I know you will direct your path. I don't know about you, but the blessings of God are very important to me. I want God's approval. Can I get an amen? I want the approval of God on the decisions that I make in life. I want the approval of God in everything in my life. Listen to what David said in Psalms 1914. He wanted God's approval so bad, he said this, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable unto you, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. He said, God, I want what is in my heart to be approved by you. I want what comes out of my mouth to be approved by you. I want my heart in my mouth to be approved by you, Lord. Notice, when he talked about his heart, he's talking about his motives. Lord, I even want pure motives. In a day of deception, in a day of backbiting, in a day of stabbing people back in our society, in a day of tearing people down as we see on the news, as the day that we've seen this week with a, with, with a court uh, a nominee, when we've seen all of that this week, and tearing people down, tearing things down continually. Oh, God, don't let me have any unpure motive in my, I even want the, my motives to be pure. And listen to what he said, and the words of my mouth. So I want my motives to be pure, and I want my speech to be pure. I want everything I do and say to be approved by God. I don't want his disapproval. I want to be blessed by God. That's how you are blessed by God is when the words of your mouth and the meditations of your heart line up with God, then his blessings follow. Somebody shout amen. amen. There's one more point I want you to see. Not only did King Jehoshaphat walk in disobedience and disapproval, 30, uh, thirdly, he operated in defeat. The alliance that he made brought failure to him. Listen to 2 Chronicles 20, 37. So the ships were wrecked and never able to set sail to trade. Could it have been that God brought a hurricane to those ships where they were docked? And could it have been 
that God has such a mighty force of wind blowing that it destroyed those ships before they ever went to sail. Could have been God ordained it because he destroyed it. Hmm. And now they never fulfill their purpose. When I align myself with doubt and I align myself with fear and I align myself with worry and I align myself with anger and I align myself with lust and I align myself with gossip and I align myself with discord and I align myself with racism when I align myself with things that are not approved by God, it never brings success. Because there's only one way to have success. And for your life and my life to line up with the word of God. Other than that, it's not going to be a blessing. Don't, don't align yourself with people who do those things. Understand that our God is a God of victory. And he always blesses us with victory. In the end, it was all a defeat. All of this work, all of this effort, all of these trees cut down, all of these carpenters, all of this fleet of ships, every effort, everything is done. And it went nowhere. How many times have we done that in our lives? We spent so much effort, so much energy, so much resources, and it went nowhere. Because we didn't line up with God's word. And if that's you today, I got a good word for you. God can turn things around for you. If you've had some failure in your life, and you've had some bad things in your life, our God knows how to turn things around for you. He knows how to turn it around for you. And here's what I'm saying. If you've been struggling with defeat, you've been struggling with failure, and you just feel like my life is never going to get on course. My life is never going to set sail. My life is never going to be productive. My life is never going to make connections. My life is never going to go forth. I'm like those ships. I can't get out of dock. God can help you with that. And if that's you, I want to pray for you today. I came here today with a sense that God was going to do something really, really powerful. That God can help us rebuild the ship of life. And God can help us get back on course. And he tells us how to do it. So if you're here today and you say, Pastor, I, I, I'm just struggling. That's the word that keeps coming to me is struggling. I'm struggling. I'm not able to get where I feel like I need to be in life. I'm not able to get there and I'm struggling and I need the Lord to help me today. Would you raise your hand? Are you here? I don't do this to embarrass you. I don't do this to embarrass you. I do this because I want to help you. If you raised your hand, I want you to stand and come stand up here with me because I want to pray with you. I'm not going to embarrass you, but I am going to pray with you. If you're here and you say, I've just been struggling and I'm not able to get where I feel like I need to be in life and I, I don't want to be like those ships that never set sail. I want to get to where God has for me. I want you to come stand. Just come stand right up here with me. Just, just come stand right up here. Come on, brother. Come on. Just, man. one sister to come stand behind one sister, each of these sisters and I want at least one sister to come. I want at least one brother to come stand behind the brothers that are up here right now. Would you just come? Father Father sometimes we allow the frustration of defeat and the frustration of failure to make us believe that nothing's ever going to change.